Welcome to the Journey of Cyberlogic, a full playthrough and game guide of Final Fantasy XI. Episode 6, The Journey Abroad. Now in the previous five episodes, we've covered our first nine hours of playthrough, which involves getting the ability to summon three trust, starting our unity progression, and starting to earn unity accolades and sparks, progressing on our Sandoria missions through mission 2.1, We've also proceeded along the Rhapsodies of Vanadiel pathline through Mission 1.4, which would allow us to give access to our subjob. We currently have our Red Mage at level 23 and our Black Mage subjob at level 15. In the last episode, we showed you how to get pre-level 99 weapons and armor quite easily using your sparks. We completed the quest to get our first Chocobo egg and got access to ride the Chocobo with the Chocobo license. We also completed the mount quest, meaning that we have the raptor now, which will be our main mount until we get another. In this episode, we'll start with going over the basics of chocobo raising, and then going into Sandoria missions 2.2 and 2.3, allowing us to achieve rank 3 in Sandoria. We will then complete our ROV missions through mission 1.7, which will allow us to summon a fourth trust. We will also trigger the starting missions for Moogle, Kupo de Tat, A Crystalline Prophecy, and the Shantoto Ascension. We will also catch up on our spells, as on our main job of Red Mage, we have been unable to get all of the spells that this job can use from the few NPCs we've been visiting. I'll go ahead and show you how to acquire the rest of the spells, as you may need to use similar techniques to acquire them for your White Mage, Black Mage, or other jobs. We will then finish taking our Red Mage, who is currently at level 23, to the level of 30, which will unlock the ability to use any of the quests that will unlock any of the remaining jobs that were not the initial six. At the completion of this episode, we will be roughly 15 hours into our total playtime in Final Fantasy XI. Let's go ahead and start this episode's first topic, Chocobo Raising. Now it used to be a more important part of Final Fantasy XI than it is now, but it's still a very rewarding experience and I suggest new players take part in it. Now raising a chocobo allows you to care for, play with, race, and ride your chocobo all around Vanadiel. Now after trading your egg to one of the trainers in the three starting nations, you will need to wait four days for it to hatch. Now during this period of time, all you'll be able to do is watch over your chocobo daily and set up a basic care plan. Now once your egg hatches on day five, your chick will be born. You will then get access to additional activities you can do with your chocobo, such as go for a walk and tell it a story, and your care plan options will also increase. Now it's important that you set up a care plan for your chocobo so that he's taken care of while you're logged off. You'll want to take careful care of your chocobo during this initial period when he's a chick until he becomes an adolescent on day 19. Now on day 19, when your chick becomes an adolescent, it will also tell you what their ending color will be when they become an adult. The possible options will be yellow, black, blue, green, and red, with yellow being the most common option. Now, upon reaching adolescence, you will get additional activities that you can do with your chocobo, as well as care plan options. In regards to activities, you will now be able to go on longer walks and compete your chocobo against others. Additionally, in regards to care plan options, you will get your widest access to different care plans that you've gotten to this point, including exercising, interacting with children and other chocobos, carrying packages, and exhibiting to the public. Now it's at this point that your chick reaches adolescence that you really want to start to focus on what it is you want to do and be the primary purpose for this chocobo. You can gear them towards racing, digging, getting you quickly to locations, or even passing down their traits to their children. Now the different stats that you can have with your chocobo are strength, endurance, discernment, receptivity, affection, energy, and payment. Now each one of those is going to go up or down depending on the care plan activity you chose for your chocobo. It'll also go up and down depending on other factors such as the activities you participate with them in and the food that you feed them. Now this was not meant to be a complete guide to raising chocobos, just more of an introductory, so we'll go ahead and stop there. But if you need more information in regards to how to correctly raise your chocobo and give it the right stats for whatever purpose you're choosing to do with them, I'm going to put a link down in the description there to the BG Wiki page that can explain all of this in detail. 
Now the next thing we're going to do is progress in the Rhapsodies of Vanadil storyline. This will allow us to summon a fourth trust. Now, the Rhapsodies of Vanadil storyline is one of my favorite in the game, and it really is an interesting experience to be going through it at the beginning of my playthrough as I'm doing here, as opposed to the end of my playthrough as I did with my previous character of Logical. What's really nice about the Rhapsodies of Vanadil storyline from a new player perspective is if you follow it, it will take you through all of the initial play and expansions of the game, starting you with finishing off, taking care of your initial starting city and all the missions that go along there, and then working you through the expansions so that the Rhapsodies of Vanadil actually goes with your progression through the game, so that at the completion of the Rhapsodies of Vanadil, you will have pretty much in essence finished the rest of the game's expansions as well. It's this Rhapsodies of Vanadil progression path that I will be using on the journey of CyberLogic. Now in the next chapter in the Rhapsodies of Vanadil, we spoke with an NPC in Selbina, or Mora, depending on your starting nation, that teleported us to Norg here. Now this is our first visit to Norg, and we won't be back here for some time. So you want to be sure to hit all of the home points like I'm doing right here, and the survival guide to make sure that you have easy methods to get back here in the future, because this is on one of the far reaches of the world. Now after you've done all that, you want to go ahead and proceed up these stairs that you're seeing right here to the Oaken Door at K8. You want to click on this door two times to complete both missions 1.5 and 1.6. At the conclusion of the second cutscene, we will have access to summon four trust thanks to the Rhapsodies in White key item. Note other benefits from this are we get a 30% bonus to our experience and limit point gains, a 100% increase to combat and magic skill gains, and then when using Fields of Valor, we're getting a reduction in the amount of tabs it takes to do pretty much everything. Additionally, we are getting an 80% reduction in the gill consumed by using home points to travel from one point to another, so that's going to help us out a lot there and basically making it so that the home point travels cost us practically nothing. It reduces the amount of gill or tabs consumed by using the survival guides. And the last thing I want to point out is it also will now give you items that you can purchase from the Courier Vendor Moogles that are at the three starting nations. Now you can get lots of great supplies from these Moogles that are otherwise no longer stocked at the auction houses. I'll be sure to show you what items are now available to us from that Courier Moogle later on in this video. Now sadly, if I was going to include all of the mission cutscenes in my Journey of CyberLogic videos, they were going to end up being way too long. But to make up for this, I've gone ahead and recorded all of those cutscenes and will be posting short videos covering things like the different missions for the starting nations, as well as all the expansion cutscenes, including Rhapsodies of Vanadil. If you're interested in this, make sure you check out this cutscene series on my channel. On to our next objective which is going to be the rank 2.2 mission. Now this can be skipped in most nations, but I'm a completionist and like to go ahead and show you everything inside of these different expansions. So we'll go ahead and show you what this mission involves. Now note, you may need to trade a crystal or two to the gate guard to get offered this. However, I did not need to, so you may no longer need to do that. They may have made the rank up process easier from what I can see. Now to complete this mission, we simply need to go to a place called Devoy, which is through another location called Junger Forest, neither of which have we been to yet, but they're both beyond Lathane Plateau. Now once in Devoy, we're going to need to get a Temple Knight's Devoy report and bring it back to here to the Gate Guard. Now normally, like many things, this used to be much more challenging, as we had to trek all the way through Lathane Plateau, through Junger Forest, into Devoy, which would take us quite some time. However, just like we used to get to Juno, and like you can use to get to Sabina and Mora, we can use our Unity Warp NPC to get us right there to the outpost at Junger Forest. Now obviously, if you are attempting your first playthrough in the nations of Bastuk or Windurst, then the mission you undertake will have a different objective, but most of these same principles can be used to speed along your playthrough and the completion of said missions. Now once we get to Junger Forest, we could of course simply just hop on our raptor mount and make the quick trek over to Devoy. But I want to encourage you to kind of enjoy the world of Final Fantasy and the danger that can come from it. Therefore, go ahead and summon a few trust 
and I recommend killing a few orcs on your way to Devoy. Uh, perhaps even signing up for an FOV objective here at the outpost and accomplishing that to get some extra experience. Around this time, you should be between level 20 and 25 if you've been following my progression. And we want to try to get to level 30 by the end of this segment right here, so any experience we can get is going to be helpful. Now once we do finally zone into Devoy, we want to make sure to get the survival guide that's right here so we can easily get back here again in the future, and then speak to the NPC right here at the zone which will inform us that the report has sadly been lost just inside the zone. Now again, you have an option here. There's two ways to go about this. If you simply just want to get through with this as quickly as possible, you'll want to use Sneak and Invisible, either the spells or potions, to get to the necessary location which is just south of you, about 100 to 150 meters and then stealthily head back. This will of course accomplish it quickly, but get us no additional experience. Conversely, you can go ahead and summon your trust and fight your way to the necessary spot, and then back again. I ended up fighting my way there and back, and we were rewarded with level 26. Now once you return to the NPC, you will be given the key item of Templus Knight's Devoy Report. You can now use your Warp Ring to get back to Sandoria, and finish mission 2.2. Note that in your playthrough, if you want to skip your 2.2 mission, you can do so by simply trading three crystals to your conquest NPC, and they will then offer you the 2.3 quest right after 2.1. Speaking of mission 2.3, let's move on to that now, as that's where we're going to spend the majority of the rest of this video. Now in all three nations, the quest is titled The Journey Abroad. It will take you to the other two nations that are not your starting nation. Now just like everything involving travel, this quest used to take a lot longer than it does these days. You used to have to set off towards Selbina or Mora and use a boat to get to the other side of the world to try and visit one of those other nations, making the journey take, at times, several hours. Of course, with that Unity NPC warp that we've been using, we can now get there within a matter of a minute or two. Before you head off though, you want to know that which nation you go to first does make a difference in this quest. Now overall the difficulty isn't dramatically different, but if you go to Bastuk first and Windurst second, then you'll actually have an easier time as the Windurst dragon at the very end of this mission does not cast petrification. However, the Bastuk dragon does, so make sure you keep this small difference in mind. Other than that, there really isn't much difference in the difficulty or the time it takes to complete either of these two paths. For our example, we're going to head off to Windurst first and Bastuk second, basically creating the more difficult of the two scenarios. Please note that to win the battlefield that is at the end of this mission, I suggest that you are at a minimum of level 25, have the ability to summon four trust, and I'll also point out that the ability to sleep if you're on a job that can do that will substantially ease the difficulty of the fight that is at the end of this mission 2.3. After receiving the mission, you will be rewarded with a trust of one of the members of your starting nation. Make sure you trade that in before you head out, before you continue with this quest. I also recommend that if you're on one of the three mage jobs at this point in the game, you want to be sure to go to whichever NPC sells the scrolls in your starting nation and make sure to buy all the scrolls that are up to the level that you are currently at, possibly even as high as level 30 to get some of those spells ahead of time so you can use them as soon as you level. Please keep in mind though that this NPC in the starting nations only offers a small subset of the spells that you can possibly use. You will also want to go to Selbina or Mora to make sure that you talk to the spell NPCs there, there are three of them in each, to make sure that you buy up any spells that you can use from either of those locations. Finally, you want to make sure that you go to Lower Juno, and there is a scroll NPC in the middle of that map as well that will end up selling you the remaining scrolls that you may have access to. Now even with going to all of those NPCs, that will not get you all of the spells that you have access to at this point in the game. Some just need to be attained through other means. Now, one of those other means is always just to purchase it from the auction house, but with some of these, you're going to spend a premium doing so, so it may be easier just to farm it yourself. First, let's start with Paralyze. This is a very easy drop that occurs normally early on in the game to you as you're just going around your starting nation. If it doesn't happen to drop, feel free to just purchase this off the auction house, as it's normally quite inexpensive, only a few thousand gil. The next one is Bind, which is in that same scenario of usually you get it early on, 
and if you don't, it's usually just a few thousand gil, go ahead and purchase it so that you have it. Now the next two are slightly more expensive, but they are also much more difficult to get in regards to drop rates early on in the game, and that is Silence and Gravity. These are usually 10 to 20,000 gil, but again, the drop rate can be difficult and take some time, and therefore I advise that it's just best to use your sparks to buy one shield and sell it for near 30,000 gil, which will give you enough to purchase both Silence and Gravity. Now the last two spells I'm going to mention you definitely should quest for early on in the game because they can be useful on in your early game playthrough. The first is Blaze Spikes, which can be quested in Windurst and usually only takes about 15 to 20 minutes to obtain to complete the two quests necessary in order to get it. You'll also get an early game good necklace for your mages while doing these two quests. The next one is the Drain spell, which is very important in this game and will be useful for the Black Mage. If you need this, you want to be sure to complete the quest that can be found in Sandoria in the Oubliette. Now you can purchase the items necessary to complete both the Windurst and the Sandoria missions for these spells directly off the auction house for only a few thousand gil. You also could go out and try and farm the items yourself, but for a few thousand gil, your time is better spent elsewhere. Now if you're a melee job as opposed to mage, you won't need to worry about any of these spells, but what you will want to do is make sure you're continually going to the Sparks NPC to purchase the most up-to-date weapon so that you're always doing the most damage that you can be doing in your role. Additionally, go ahead and purchase armor, though it is not as important at this stage in the game. Now I want to point out that right around this stage when you're traveling around Vanadil, you will normally get the initial cutscene for three add-on missions. The Shantoto Ascension, the Mughal Kupo Detat, and the Crystalline Prophecy. These are add-on expansions that add to the story and lore of the game, and the rewards for them are rather outdated, so they really have no place in endgame content. That being said, I will be covering these three add-on expansions once our initial Sandoria missions are complete. Now that we have updated our spells and equipment, it's time to head off for one of the other two nations on mission 2.2. In our example, we're going to head off towards Windurst first. We need to go inside the Sandoria Consulate and speak with Maurices. We will then head to Heaven's Tower and speak with Kupipi, who will give us the shield offering key item. Additionally, she will be giving us the cipher to Semeth, which is one of the best ranged trust in the game. Make sure you trade this into your nearest trust NPC as soon as you can. Now, Kupipi is going to send you towards the zone of Gideas. You want to make sure that you have the map of Gideas, which can be purchased for 600 gil from any of the map NPCs if you have not purchased it already. As said in a previous video, I suggest you purchase all of the maps from the map NPCs that are under 1,000 gil. Now, Gideas is very much like the Gelsba outpost back in Sandoria, in that it is full of beastmen mobs. This time though, as opposed to having orgs populating the zone, it will be another type of beastman, the Yagudo. These two, mixed with the Quidavs that we will experience in Bastuk, make the three primary beastman races. Now almost all of the mobs that you're going to experience in Gideas are going to be too low of a level to aggro you at this point, so you should be able to easily go past all of them without them giving you too much trouble. Now once you zone into Gideas, you want to make sure that you immediately look on your map and locate G8. Right here at this location, there will be a hole that you can drop down that will get you to the NM you need to defeat. Drop down the hole in this location, and then go north along the path until you encounter the NM called Zu Bu the Silent. Now please note that as you go along this path, you most commonly will encounter another NM, Iman the Ironbreaker. Go ahead and defeat him really quick if you can as he also drops a knife that is good for mages that allows them to absorb MP anything that happens. Now, both of these NMs are going to be ninjas, which means they will normally start with a lot of shadows up and will continually put them up throughout the fight. One of the quickest and easiest ways to get rid of shadows is to use a Ga spell. In this case, I suggest using Diaga and it will quickly get rid of those shadows allowing you to continue to deal damage. Now the reason we're killing Zubu the Silent here is to get the drop of a Piranha Shield that looks to have a 100% drop rate. However, we need two shields in order to complete the quest. 
Therefore, after you finish taking out Zubu the Silent the first time, you then need to wait in this area approximately 5 minutes for him to respawn so that you can kill him once again. After you killed him both times, you should now have two Piranha Shields. We will head west to F7 to then speak with U Zuhomu. And here, he will give us a key item, and then that will allow us to return to our Sandorian Consulate and trade these two Piranha Shields to Mauritius, who will allow us to then proceed along to the next nation along our path, being Basto. I also want you to keep in mind that at this point in the game, we can use up to four trusts to help us to take on these two NMs. I chose not to use them when taking on this content, just to show you how much of a challenge they can pose when it's just you and not your group of trust doing all the damage. But really, if you're going for the fastest playthrough of the game, you want to be using your trust. And if you're looking for the most challenging playthrough, go ahead and try and use as few trusts as possible, or even zero, to give you the experience that was originally intended when this game was designed back in 2002. After you've traded in your two shields and finished your Windurst path, now it's time to head to Bastuk. Just like we did with Windurst, go ahead and go back to your Unity NPC and use them to teleport to South Gustaberg, where you simply need to head north from your starting location to get to the nation of Bastuk. Now being sure to get all the home point crystals and survival books along your path, make your way into the metalworks of Bastuk, and then to the top floor to the Sandorian Consulate, and you want to speak with Save Pelid. Once you're speaking with him, he will want you to then head to the Pious NPC, which is inside the Department of Industry, located near the President's office. And then lastly, you will want to speak with Grom who can still be found on that upper level, but inside the Craftsman's Eatery. Now after you've spoken with all of those NPCs, you will be ready to head on your journey to the Beastman Dungeon of Bastuk, Palborough Mines. Now you want to make sure that you have the map of Palborough Mines if you haven't picked it up yet. It's only 600 gil from one of the map NPCs. Now once in Palborough Mines, there is a path that would get you to the top floor easier than the others, and that is by way of the elevator. You want to make sure that you reach the elevator at I-8 on the first floor and take it up to the top floor. And then make your way to the Wafren Shine entrance at H-10 on this top map. Now a note of caution, once you get to the top of this elevator shaft, you want to summon all four of your trust. And if you don't want to fight anything, make sure you put Sneak Up for the rest of your journey. The orcs on this top floor are of relatively high level and will attack you on sight the majority of the time. They will also increase in level the closer you get to the shrine's entrance, with the final ones right before the shrine posing the biggest challenge, so make sure you don't rush it. Additionally, there is a home point crystal right before you zone in to the shrine. Make sure you get that so that in the future you have a quick way to get right back to this battlefield, as you will return here a variety of times on your Final Fantasy XI playthrough for many reasons. Once inside, we will enter the battlefield and go up against a fight that will be the most challenging yet in our playthrough. A fight against two different bosses. The first being the Seeker, which is an Ahurman type of monster. It's basically a giant eye that will cast Black Mage spells, including Silence. And a Dark Dragon, which is a dragon type NM that will use AoE attacks and an ability called Petro Eyes that will petrify everything in front of him. Now here we are in the battlefield itself. We have summoned Valenril as our tank, Millie as our white mage, and Tenzen and Simli to deal most of our damage. Now as you saw, we opened with me casting Sleep on the Dark Dragon, which did land. We now can focus purely on the Seeker, which is not sleepable. We want to try and get in as many Enfeebles as we can while our damage dealers get the damage in. With Tenten and Seme both on it, he should go down relatively quickly. You then want to immediately redirect your attention to the Dark Dragon. Now positioning on the Dark Dragon is important as he will quite often use Petro Eyes which will petrify everyone in front of him. Now positioning your trust can be difficult. Now the best way I have found to deal with trust positioning is to be spinning around the monster as you're getting that first swing in. This normally has the effect of having your tank right behind you and then the other characters a few steps behind him, making them so they're out of the conal range of your tank. Note, I didn't really do a good job of that here, and as we stand right now, the tank 
Millie, Tenzen are all in range of being hit by Petrorize if it's used. And in fact, there it goes. Now all three of them will pretty much be useless for the rest of this fight. Now thankfully, Samil was out of range when this Petra Eyes went off, so she can continue to get damage in, and we can continue to keep her alive, and continue to get our own damage in as we're doing here to finish off this fight. Now after you finish taking out that Dark Dragon, you will have the win and be treated to your rank 2.3 final cutscene. Then, to finish your mission and achieve rank 3, you need to go back to Bastuk inside of the Sandorian Consulate and speak with Seve Pelid on the top floor once again. He will reward you with 3000 gil, an adventurer's certificate, and your rank 3. Now at this point in our playthrough, we have achieved a level 26 red mage. You should be around a similar level. After you achieve rank 3, I suggest you stop doing any other rank missions until you get to level 30, because at that point, you are given the option to use any of the jobs in the game, and you quite possibly may determine that you want to pick one of the other jobs that were not one of those six starting jobs. Now to get those last three levels that you need, I suggest that you simply head out of Port Juno to Quiffum, and then get one of the FOV pages on the book here. I suggest the one where you kill worms and crabs, and then just start killing many worms and crabs in the area to fulfill those objectives. Also, don't forget, to undergo the ROE objective for Quiffum to make sure that you're also getting the experience, sparks, and unity accolades from that as well. Now it should take you less than 30 minutes to get the five levels that you may need at this point to get to level 30. I have just hit level 26 at this particular point and it only took me a little over 15 minutes to get all four of those levels. It's really amazing how quickly experience can go these days with the use of trust. Make sure that you're using a variety of your job's spells and abilities to make sure that you're skilling up as much as you can during this phase. You also want to make sure that you have Signet up so that you're earning conquest points. And then lastly, make sure that you're using your Emperor Band if you haven't used it yet, as it will give you a great 50% boost to the experience you earn. Now the last thing we're going to go over here in Episode 6 is as promised earlier, I'm gonna show you the items that you now have available to you at the Courier Vendor Moogle. Now these are available in all three of the starting port cities. Now first you can get some items here. The most useful ones I would say would be the Prism Powder and Silent Oil if you're not a mage. Those will help you get through some of these starting zones if you need to sneak or invisible. The next thing you can get from him is ammunition. Now if you are in any of the ranged jobs such as Corsair, Ranger, or even a job such as Thief that uses bullets, or Ninja that uses shuriken, you can get additional supplies for those here. Additionally, on Ninja, you can get all of your associated Ninja tools right here from the Courier Vendor Moogle, which will oftentimes be much cheaper than you can get from the auction house. Next, we come to Foodstuffs, where you can get much of the beginning game food. The best food to start with here is probably gonna be the Corel Sub, there are some other useful foods here as well, such as ones that will increase your skill gain rate. Now the next thing we're going to get from the Courier Vendor Moogle are scrolls. At this present time it's a bunch of the similar scrolls that we could get from one of the Conquest Gate Guards, but at least now you can get all the things you need in one spot from this Courier Vendor Moogle. The next thing that he offers to you is you can actually get keys to the various dungeons around Vanadil. This can save you a lot of time as you progress through the game when you encounter quests that require you to open chest and coffers. The last line item from the Courier Vendor Moogle will give you key items, but at this time there are none available to you. And there we are, level 30, just under 15 hours into our playthrough. That's going to be it for episode 6. I hope you found that helpful. In the next episode in the series, we will be covering the basics of job selection. Thanks so much for watching everyone. Stay safe and stay healthy out there.